Thank you, Sophia. Thank you for the uh, kind introduction and for the possibility to be here, um, to be a fellow at the Keto Hamburger College. I was very happy to have the possibility to come here and I've enjoyed it much. Um, thank you. Now I prepared some information for you um, about some members of the calendar families and I hope it will be helpful to follow the introduction of my talk. It's a bit tricky since many Carolingians have the same name. But um, yeah, that's the early Middle Ages for you. Now, in the ninth century, the Frankish scholar Einhard wrote the Vita Caroli Magni, a vivid portrait of Charlemagne. Einhard had known the king personally because he had been a member of the court for many years. He had also served as an advisor to Charlemagne's son and successor, Louis the Pious, for whom he probably composed the Emperor's Vita. Einhard presented Charles' victories over his enemies, his successes as a conqueror, and his virtues as a king. And he gave his readers a glimpse into the family life of the emperor. Charlemagne had been married several times and had numerous children by wives and concubines alike. Einhard described the king as being a loving and devoted husband, father, and grandfather. Alas, his firstborn son apparently had turned away from him. He was handsome, but a hunchback. When his father was wintering in Bavaria, he feigned sickness and conspired against his father with some of the leading Franks, who won him over with the empty promise of the kingdom. After the plot was detected and the conspirators condemned, he was tonsured and permitted to take up the religious life he had long desired in the monastery of Prüm. Now historians call this prodigal son Pippin the Hunchback. Unfortunately, as has long been known, Einhard's version of Pippin's fate is flawed. Rather than being the son of a concubine, Pippin was the son of Charles' first wife, Himmeltrude. Soon after Pippin's birth, she was repudiated by her husband who thought to marry another woman. Then in retrospect, Einhard diminished her position as wife. There have been some discussions among historians concerning his plot. The execution of several noble uh, indicates that the threat might have been substantially. Although the trigger that led Pippin to take part in the rebellion is debated, it seems to be sure that he felt sidelined by his father. Within the family, he was probably disadvantaged in comparison to the king's other sons from his third wife. Anyway. Pippin was tonsured and exiled in the Abbey of Prüm, which was one of the Carolingians' most favorite monasteries. Einhard's half-hearted claim Pippin had thought a religious life for himself is obviously of little credibility. Nevertheless, Pippin did go on to live as a monk for nearly 20 years until his death. Approximately 90 years after Pippin the Hunchback had been plotting against his father, an actual illegitimate Carolingian was also striving for a kingdom of his own. You, Duke of Osacek, son of King Lothar II and his concubine Valdrada, fought his whole life to get recognized as a Carolingian king. His sources are not fond of him and speak of him mainly as a tyrant. Ultimately though, Emperor Charles the Fat, his father's cousin, learned of a plot that you and his brother-in-law had planned. The latter was executed, the former blinded, and exiled to a cloister. After short stays in the monastery of St. Gallen and Fulda, Yu was finally sent to the monastery of Prüm, just like Pippin the Hunchback roughly a hundred years before him. There he became a monk and was tonsured by the abbot himself. Like Pippin, Yu lived in Prüm until his death. Now, to be honest, um, Using the cloister to push male family members who were considered unfit to rule into the siding was a Carolingian trait. By doing so, the Carolingians followed their ancestor, Pepin the Short, the first king from the family. Pepin's own ascent to the throne was a coup that included having the Merovingian, the last Merovingian king, Chilric III, and his son tonsured, and, he guessed it, brought away to be held in the monastery. The public procedure aimed at making visible what was an established fact, namely that the former kings had lost the ability to rule. For the sons of Carolingian kings to be forced into religious orders 
was a punishment. It was regarded as such, even if the intentions were sincere. Western Frankish King Charles the Bald was Louis the Pious' youngest son. After his father's death, he had to fight against his half-brothers for a kingdom of his own in a brutal civil war in the 1840s. He possibly tried to spare his own sons the same fate by designating his younger children for church offices, and he is the only ninth century Carolingian king who did so. Uh, one of his sons was handicapped from birth and sent to a monastery already as an infant. He became an abbot but died uh, at the age of 18. Another of the king's younger sons named Carloman was also designed for an ecclesiastical career. He was tonsured probably at the age of six. In his case, there were no obvious impediments such as disability, and it was the king's son from his recognized wife, the queen. But Carloman never accepted his father's decision to exclude him from succession. Although he was an abbot not in one, but several rich monasteries, Carloman was not satisfied. He tried to claim a part of the kingdom as his inheritance. As a consequence, the Frankish bishops deposed him and he was temporarily imprisoned. When he still would not give up his claim and gathered aristocratic support, the king, his father, struck hard. Coloman was tried in court, found guilty and blinded. He died shortly afterwards in exile, but at his uncle's court, not in a cloister. I think um, you get my point. The sons of the Carolingian kings saw themselves as rulers. They certainly did not want to become clerics. And this is true not only for the sons who were born to legally married couples, but also for those who were fathered outside of marriage. Quite a few of these illegitimate Carolingians are mentioned by name in the various sources that tell us about the Frankish realm and the Carolingian family. Most of them are described as warriors. They were part of the aristocratic elite. Some like the historian Nitard were scholars, but almost all of them were laymen. In the late ninth century, Arnulf of Corinthia was an experienced military leader and the illegitimate son of King Carloman, King of Bavaria and Italy. Around the year 887, Arnold seized an opportunity and became East Frankish King. Ultimately, he rose to the position of emperor. Not every illegitimate Carolingian was successful, but as Brigitte Kasten has shown, these men had possibilities. Under the right circumstances and with the noble support, they could be kings. Especially without an influential mother, the chances to succeed were slim. Still, no one perceived life in the clergy as an honorable alternative. And this is why it is so rare that Carolingian sons who were cast aside accepted their fate. When Charlemagne died in the year 814, he had left his vast realm to his son Louis the Pious as his sole heir. And you can see here a contemporary um, depiction of him. But Louis was not the emperor's only living son at the time of his death. Charlemagne was also survived by three sons who had been born by his concubines. Their names were Hugh, Drogo, and Theodoric. All were minors at the time of their father's death. As such, they were dependent on their elder half-brother, lived at his court and under his wardship. This seems not to have been a problem at first. But in 1817, the young man's life changed dramatically. After he had almost died in an accident, Louis the Pious was determined to secure his reign and his son's future rule. He issued a capitulary that ordered his succession and the division of power amongst his sons. His younger half-brothers were clearly seen as a potential threat to this order. Although Louis' legislation already forbade the succession of the sons of concubines, they had to become monks. Hugh, Jogo, and Theodoric were tonsured and sent away from the court to live in a cloister. But soon Louis the Pious showed contrition over his actions, which, amongst others, had also caused the death of his nephew. After engaging in a public penance, the emperor reconciled with his brothers. Theodoric died um, apparently soon after, but Hugh and Drogo lived on to become influential clerics in the time. Hugh was made abbot of the monastery of Saint Quentin. Drogo was elected Bishop of Metz, the same bishopric 
the worship calendar and since the St. Arnold had held. Both remained loyal allies to the half-brother Louis. This is noteworthy because Emperor Louis's reign was shattered during the 1830s by the rebellion of his own sons against him. In 1833, nearly all of the emperor's men, including most bishops in his entourage, defected. But his half-brothers, Hugh and Drogo, stayed by his side. The rebellion failed due to the protagonist's inability to work together, and Louis was reinstated as ruler. The emperor now kept his half-brothers especially close for the rest of his life. Hugh became imperial archchancellor and abbot of two additional monasteries. Drogo also remained at court with the emperor's confessor. He is said to have been his closest confidant. On his deathbed, Louis handed to Drogo the regalia, signs of royal power to give to Luther, his oldest son and co-emperor. Drogo was also responsible for the emperor's burial and took Louis's remains to Metz. Both Hugh and Drogo played their part in the Frankish civil wars that did take place after Louis the Pius's death, but I will end their story at this point. It should have become clear that the lives of these two illegitimate sons of Charlemagne were pretty unusual. They never attempted to get rid of the spiritual stand that was forced onto them. They never tried to claim some of their father's inheritance for themselves. They were the only sons of a ninth century Frankish king who actually were clerics. In other words, they were the exception that proved the rule. But change comes sometimes rather quickly. The Frankish tradition of dividing the rule between sons had been the cause of violence for centuries. Because of it, Charlemagne's empire fell apart in the civil war in the middle of the ninth century. Uh, here you can see the Frankish realm at the end of the ninth century. The Franks felt the vanishing power of their kings, even more because of the emerging threats of raids and invasions by pagans from north and east. The Carolingian dynasty became awfully short of male offspring. The balance of power was tested by emerging aristocratic players who felt more suitable for the leadership position. These new kings of the 10th century went to great lengths to ensure that only one of their sons would become their successor and all other sons, legitimate and illegitimate, had to be provided for in other ways. Now, let us concentrate on the illegitimate sons of kings in the 10th century in the territory that had once been Charlemagne's empire. Uh, without going into detail, I can assure you the situation was completely reversed in comparison to the 9th century. Unsurprisingly, kings continued to father children outside of marriage. But whereas in the 9th century, the king's sons who were born outside of wedlock almost never became clerics, in the 10th century, all of them did. Archbishops, bishops, and deacons can be found among them. And we have examples in the Western and Eastern Frankish realm from the Kingdom of Burgundy and in Italy. These men often went on to hold strategically relevant positions within the church. They became influential players, taking part in important political disputes. Sources prove they were regarded as an asset by their families, and not once did one of them try to gain a secular dominion for himself. And the thing is, just before this, I would say a significant change in social behavior, elite families can be observed, we find with Regine of Prüm, the very first medieval author who argued explicitly against the ordination of males who were born outside of wedlock. And I should think that it's worth taking a closer look at these developments, which I described to you. And that is uh, what I want to do um, here at the Kitter Hamburger Colleague in Münster to dig, dig a little bit deeper into the relationship between legal and social change in the history of medieval illegitimacy in this period. Now, during the next 30 minutes, I would first like to introduce you to the phenomenon of illegitimacy in the Middle Ages in general, and especially before the year 1000. Afterwards, I will present you with a selection of research positions and some of the legal source material I'm working on, uh, which will hopefully set, up my, set out my objectives in more detail. Just to be clear, in my research, I generally use illegitimacy as a generic term. Uh, as such, it summarizes manifestations of legal, social, and cultural origin 
And I think of the term as being the most neutral to describe the phenomenon, although I have been told that not everybody would agree with this assessment. Um, the perspectives on illegitimacy differ, differ dramatically and depend very much on who you are asking. 20th, 20th century philosopher Jenny Teichman, for example, argued that, and I quote, an illegitimate child is one whose conception and birth did not take place according to the rules which in its parents' community govern reproduction. In contrast, legal historian Dipa Vilovaj, writing in the 1990s, understood illegitimacy as a specific legal quality closely tied on marriage as the only legally accepted form of sexual relations. But as you'll know, marriage is far from being a static concept. And as true as this is today, it was even more true in the Middle Ages. Marriage can be a very different thing depending on the time, the region, and the community uh, we focus on. During the Middle Ages in Europe, marriage regulations were not only a legal or a social problem, but also a major political issue. This was true in the ninth century when the kingdom of Lotharingia ceased to exist due to an unsolved marital conflict of its king, Lothar II. And it still was true in the 16th century when Henry VIII broke ties with the Roman Catholic Church over his divorce from his first wife and made himself supreme head of the Church of England. But marriage was not only a matter of debate for kings and popes. Ruth Karras has shown that even at a time when canon law had long defined marriage and the church exercised control over it, there was still room for interpretation. In 15th century Paris, couples actually fought each other in court about the status of their relationship. They could simply not agree upon whether or not they were married. In the early Middle Ages, though, things are even more awake. That is to say, the rules that governed reproduction, to speak with Thai men, are on the one hand hard to identify due to the scarce written record that survived, and on the other hand, the findings are far from coherent. We are confronted with a diverse terminology medieval sources apply regarding illegitimacy and a lack of information what specific meaning these terms would have in a given context. There are exceptions, like Isidore Seville's uh, Etymologie, which laid out the meaning of the most important Latin terms, naturale, spurius, and notus. But even Isidore's explanations were not without ambiguities. And more importantly, Although Isidore was widely read in the early Middle Ages, we cannot be sure that a ninth century author using these terms would understand them the same way that Isidore did. And this is true for legal and historiographic sources, and it is the reason why a careful and close reading of source material is of the essence. What's maybe even more important is to recognize that in many cases, authors would use none of the terms that were available especially in early medieval times. So it seems that as long as a father accepted a child as being his own, there was no general need felt to qualify their connection to their families. While an author like Einhardt might have used the term concubine deliberately to mark uh, the different ranks uh, between uh, you and Jorgo's mother and um, Louis the Pius's mother, other contemporary sources never speak of their descent. They only tell us uh, about the venerable Abidu and Bishop Drogo as Emperor Louis's brothers and close confidants. And there is absolutely no need to assume they were regarded otherwise by their contemporaries. Now, medieval sources do not describe a person's descent with the word illegitimus or vernacular equivalents. Um, in the High Middle German, there is, uh, for example, the term unecht until later Middle Ages. The counter terms um, legitimus, though, was applied consistently to qualify marriages, children's and heirs, especially but not exclusively in legal sources. The most notorious term regarding illegitimacy, bastardos, and its vernacular derivations, patar, uh, 
bastard, bastard, are only to be found since the 11th century. Early medieval sources sometimes use the Latin terms naturalis purius and notus to describe children of illicit relationships. These terms could have very precise legal or social meaning. They could refer to children whose parents were of different social status, to children of concubines, to children of slaves and prostitutes who would never have been able to marry. Uh, but as I said, they could also be used more or less synonymous. And this very much depends on the source in question. In general, legal sources tended to concern themselves much more with the parents than with their children. The latter were only mentioned occasionally in legal provisions regulating marriage, warning parents not to engage in legally invalid unions, otherwise their children would not be considered as heirs. Historians of the 19th and 20th century have taken these um, sources very seriously. But their assumption that a clear-cut understanding of illegitimacy was predominant, also in the early medieval period, has been challenged since the late 20th century. Michael Bogolte and Jan Rüdiger have, on a social cultural level, generally questioned the prevailing narrative of the dominance of monogamy in the early and high Middle Ages, thus questioning the most important precondition for an existence of illegitimacy. Uh, when it comes to transfer of power, Sarah McDougall has argued lately that for potential heirs, the lawfulness of their parents' marriage was of last much less importance than the social status of the mother. McDougall views the use of terms like meretrice, pelex, and concubina, mainly as a reference to a woman's low social status and not as a legal quality. Especially the meaning of concubina has to be put under scrutiny as it is by far the most common used term in early medieval sources um, in this uh, area. Its meaning could be manifold. It could refer to a free woman who's having a stable and exclusive sexual relationship with a free, mostly noble man before he found a marriage partner. It was also used to identify more precisely woman, women being of lower social status than their sexual partners, and these women could be free or unfree. Um, sometimes concubines would also marry their partners later in life but the term was also used on women in adulterous relationships and the adultery could be on the part of the woman or the man. And last but not least, it was also used from the 11th century onwards um, for the partners of clerics to diminish them. That the broad use of the term concubina in medieval sources uh, should be seen as a warning. Seemingly united and straightforward terminology can actually conceal a plurality in legal and social meaning. Research on illegitimacy traditionally falls into one of two categories. Either historians deal with the illegitimate children's prospects of inheritance and succession, or they concern themselves with illegitimate clergy, more especially with the sons of priests. And almost never are these uh, aspects discussed together as two sides of the same coin. And this separation is understandable as each question addresses very different kinds of sources and strands of arguments. Still, I do not think it is very helpful to follow this route if you want to learn about the developments of legitimacy in the early and high Middle Ages. Admittedly, much research on medieval legitimacy begins with the late 11th and 12th century because the major legal developments in canon law regarding marriage on the one hand and clerical celibacy on the other hand were happening at that time. For example, John Whitty's The Sins of the Father on the Law and Theology of Illegitimacy, uh, published in 2009, jumps from late antiquity to the late 11th century, skipping approximately 500, 600 years of medieval history as if nothing had happened during the centuries. And with all due respect to John Whitty, I highly doubt that. The general connection between the regulation of illegitimacy in secular and canon law has long been known. Bernard Schimmelfennig wrote a paper on these matters almost 50 years ago. He argued that the strict later medieval canon and secular laws discriminating against children born out of wedlock were actually a side effect of the church attempt to enforce clerical celibacy since the 11th century. He was especially concentrating on the church attempt to exclude exclude priests' sons 
from following into the father's footsteps. But Schimmerfennig saw these canons at the starting point for all subsequent regulations and concluded that illegitimate children's right, rights had ultimately been collateral damage. Uh, subsequently, Peter Lander has shown in a paper describing the development of the defectus natalium that the earliest attempts to restrict illegitimates from becoming priests can be, back, uh, can be dated back to later Carolingian times. So to look beyond the 11th century seems necessary if we want to know how such provisions came into being. I already mentioned Sarah McDougall, who recently published a comparative study on illegitimacy in European dynasty dynasties between the 9th and 13th century. Uh, McDill did not attempt to write a comprehensive history of illegitimacy. She limited her study to the question of succession of illegitimate children. So she's not uh, particularly interested in illegitimate clergy. Of course, she's aware of the sons of kings who became clerics, but their fate is none of her concern. And as I already said, she rightfully stresses the importance of mothers regarding their children's prospect to succeed a kingly father. McDougall argues that it was the mother's lineage and her social status, which was most crucial. Such a distinction is admittedly very difficult since only a woman with a high social status would have been accepted as the king's wife. So it seems to be a little bit of a chicken egg problem. But I get McDougall's point. She states that there are no sources in the 9th and 10th century arguing that a son could not be his father's successor and heir because his parents had not been legally married. And um, that is true. McDougal acknowledges, though, that Carolingian elite society was familiar with the concept that a child who was recognized by his father could still have lesser rights to his father's estate than siblings from another mother. And often such claims are made in regard to issue of illegal unions, are uh, mostly incestuous relationships. Legal provisions of such, such kinds can be found, for example, in the uh, Lex Romana Visigotorum, which was known in the calendar realm. Single provisions with differing focuses were also included in regional barbarian laws. Salian law code excluded children born in incestuous unions from inheritance, while Burgundian laws included a similar provision concerning children born into a marriage by abduction. In German, we say Raubehe. And early medieval canon law, new such it is too. Whittier stressed that church fathers, and I quote, condemned the notion of visiting the sins of the fathers upon their children, end quote. But this would foremost refer to theological aspects of sin and redemption, and not in particular to the legal status of a child. There is a famous notion of Pope Leo the Great that like, not every son is his father's heir. Nic omnis filius eres est patris. Leo possessed profound knowledge of Roman law. His letters and sermons were widespread, as many early medieval canon law collections included them. Manuscript evidence showed they were read and copied. Now, MacDougall, of course, know this. She argued that such provisions had no practical consequences in the 8th or 9th century, or rather that there is no proof that they did, which is, which is not the same thing. But I would like to challenge this assumption. Now, a major problem for doing research on illegitimacy in the early and high Middle Ages is the absence of, of certain source types we normally use for later periods. There are no serial sources like parish or natal registers, we also lack marriage contracts or testaments that can give insight into the ways families distributed wealth among their members. But as I learned from Hans Werner Goetz, private charters survive that do work similar to testaments, and there are many. In the Monastery of St. Gaul, we find can find over 400 from the late 8th and 9th century. This is a special type of deeds of donation, Schenkungsurkunden. They are called precarial grants, or in German, precarie urkunden. And they roughly work like this. Um, someone would donate a part of or all of his estate to a church, but the church would immediately give the estate back to the donor and his family members and heirs to their use in exchange for a small interest rate or a similar fee. Agurts recognize that these contracts are not only important documentations of economic and legal procedures, it also can be used to get insight into early medieval family awareness, 
family members who should benefit from the process of retransferring good were mentioned by name and relations, and quite often in a specific sequence, uh, a specific sequence of designated heirs is listed. Agatha observed that almost all of the charges explicitly refer to the testator's legitimate offspring or heirs. Um, and these, in this chart, the term heirs definitely only refers to children, other relatives, um, parents, brothers, sisters, nephews, uncle, and so on, are always listed explicitly. Let's read these passages as a reference to children born in marriage. And of course, it's not difficult to understand why, since we have these various sources in the early Middle Ages that connect compliance with certain rules of entering a marriage with the creation of legitimate heirs. So the St. Gall charges um, should therefore be regarded as an indicator that the normative sources arguments are not as detached from social practice uh, as one could assume. Might still be a good idea though, uh, not to tie everything down to marriage. Jenny Teichmann's broader definition of legitimacy can be helpful here, I think, um, since it reminds us that the rules which govern reproduction can be adjusted to circumstances. So my take on this would be as follows. Uh, fathers could obviously differentiate between the status of their children. Some were regarded as possible heirs where others were not. And the exact grounds why such distinctions were made elude us as a source material lack explanation. And we are left to speculate. But this doesn't mean that research in this area is futile. There is still much to gain. Because, and I think this is very important, even if they did not qualify as heirs, these children were now outsiders. They were an integral part of their families and their community. And I think it's important to recognize this as a fact um, to get to a better understanding of the dynamics of medieval families. So in my work, I focus on the ways families found to compensate for this unequal legal starting position of their children. And one of the first things I realized was that in most cases, elite families in medieval Germany since the 10th century would have their illegitimate sons enter the clergy. And it struck me that many historians do not acknowledge that many illegitimate children were joining the clergy and that this phenomenon was not limited to the sons of priests. And it was a phenomenon that gets very visible in the 10th century. And that's at a time before clerical celibacy became a widely discussed issue. So before I finish my talk, I would like to introduce you to an important early medieval author, I already mentioned him, whose work has been a starting point for my thoughts. Um, that is Regino, abbot of the Monastery of Prüm in the late ninth century. Uh, you already know that uh, Carolingian family members were often exiled to Prüm, which uh, had a large estate and was a very rich monastery, and it was cited in Lotharingia one of the most contested areas of the Frankish realm in the late 9th and 10th century. So Prim is to be found between Trier and Aachen, oh, roughly around here. Now, during power struggles between the local nobility of Lotharingia, Regino was driven out of office around 899, and he had to retreat to Trier. Archbishop Radbord of Trier supported Regino and used his apparently many skills to his own advantage. Regino lived in Trier for 15 years and was abbot of St. Martin. During this time, he wrote three different works, each remarkable in its own sphere. He was the author of a treatise on music, which I've been told has great value for uh, music theory history. And Regino was also an historiographer. Most early medievalists know his chronicle about the rise and fall of the Carolingian Empire. Additionally, he also wrote an important and influential canon law collection. These Libri do de Synodalibus Causis et Disciplines Ecclesiasticis are called simply Zendhandbuch in German. And for practical considerations, I will go on using that name. Regino compi compiled the um, medically ordered collection for Bishop Hatto of Mainz explicitly to use on visitations in his archdiocese and in the Zendgericht. Wilfried Hartmann has pointed out the significance of the Zendhandbuch, since Regino had not only selected and arranged all the legal provisions, but also made several editorial choices and interventions when working with his manifold sources, 
It is there where we can see Oregano's mind at work. Landau described the abbot as an, I quote, um, innovator of law, an erneuerer des Rechts, because of these subtle reflections he offered his readers. Landau also pointed out that Regino's collection had the earliest known mention of the term macula, that is floor or makel, regarding children of illicit unions. The first book of the Lentan book includes a catalog of requirements for candidates for ordination and Regino's standards for sacred office were quite high. He offered three consecutive provisions concerning illegitimacy I now want to look into. Now the first chapter I want to discuss is already a bit problematic. The title states that children born of concubines shall not become priests. But the chapter itself quotes the sixth century council on clerical concubinage and it does say nothing about the children of these unions. So there is a bit of discussion uh, what to make of the lack of congruency. While not every rubric in the earlier manuscripts that survived seem to have been Regino's own choice, in this case, the evidence indicates that it was. Additionally, the earliest manuscripts also repeat the notion that the sons of concubines should not become priests, and so did later collectors who borrowed from Regino. And I would suggest, therefore, that we take both implications serious, the notion of the chapter and the rubric that generally excludes the sons of concubines from priesthood. Luckily, in Regino's case, we do not have to guess what he meant with concubina, since he explicitly lays it down in the Zentan book. He quoted Leo the Great on the matter and states that only a freeborn woman can be a wife, marriage had to be performed in public, and required an exchange of property between parties, a dos. A union that did not match these prerequisites would not be a marriage, but a concubinage and children uh, born into this union could not be priests. In the following chapter, Regenut cited a mid 9th century uh, calendar synod in a provision that was itself an innovation. The Council of Maupari excluded children from priesthood who were born into a union that qualified as marriage by abduction. Children born into these relationships should not be priests, not even if the marriage was legitimized subsequently. While most historians see this canon as part of the fort, Carolingian bishops um, of the fiercely fought fight of Carolingian bishops against marriage by abduction, uh, Hartmann has pointed out its relevance for the history of uh, the law in illegitimacy. The synod opened an important backdoor to its principle, though, which Regino repeated. A candidate could still be accepted if the church would benefit in a significant and exceptional way of his ordination due to his outstanding character and merits. And this is an important supplement in two ways. It would become a central argument in subsequent legislation to recognize that the individual's personal quality could sometimes make up for the parent's sin. The whole procedures of the later medieval papal penitentiary were actually based on this idea. At the same time, the provision is also a rejection of a legitimatio per subsequens matrimonio, uh, so legitimation by a later marriage of the parents, which would give the power to legitimize the child to the parents and their families rather than the church. The next, the last chapter, escalates the restrictions for illegitimate children even further. Lino cited Roman jurist Gaius, who stated that children born to incestuous or other illicit unions should be regarded as if they did not have a father and if they were born from adultery. And I underlined the passages um, of the chapter in which Regino cited Gaius and the first half of the, of the chapter. From this thought, Going onwards, Regino concluded that, I quote, and, and the translation is mine, so please forgive me. Um, for this reason, the dignity of the church does not accept those who the state laws do not allow, but reject them as if defied by the defect of the bad reputation and despise them as degenerate, especially since nothing blemish should be sacrificed to God or added to his servants. So this passage is very telling. Regina draws on Gaius only in the first half of the chapter. The conclusions are his own, 
as is the wording. It is notable that Regino explicitly states a connection between the two legal spheres of the public and the church. If a man's right were rejected by public laws, it seemed unthinkable to him that the church could accept such a person in a crucial position. Now, Regino could easily have found a canon law provision against incest. Actually, the second book of the then handbook was full of them. And this is exactly why I think this argumentation is so significant. This regulation is not particularly about incest. A secular law, restrict, uh, secular law restriction leads to a macula, to a defect. And it is this personal law which in return forces the church to issue provisions to protect its most sacred office. Now it's hard to say how relevant Regino's provisions were in practice. As far as I can say, Regino's stance on illegitimate, illegitimate clergy was probably more of an outsider position. But you know, parchment endures. Regino's law collection was well known in 10th century and influenced those who followed him. His views on illegitimacy ultimately became the official position of the Roman church in the late 11th century. And the de facto natalium was part of the Codex Juris Canonici until 1983. So I will spend the next month here at the colleague writing all of this down in a more detailed and hopefully more comprehensive manner. Uh, I want to reflect on the legal developments regarding the practices of inheritance and exclusions, um, exclusion of legitimate clergy. I tried to outline. And against this background, I would compare the cases of 9th and 10th century members of the clergy who were the illegitimate sons of kings. So I hope I could show you tonight that two seemingly very different things are connected through illegitimacy. On the one hand, questions of inheritance and succession, and on the other hand, rules for priestly ordination. Changes of, uh, in one area of law and legal practice probably have influenced the other, as the temporal coincidence might indicate. Now, as I mentioned earlier, at least in medieval Germany, Elite families continued to follow the example of Charlemagne's youngest sons, Drogo and Yu. For centuries, German princes had their illegitimate sons enter the clergy almost exclusively. The exception had become the rule. Thank you. <laughs>